Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're looking at episode 4 of Fast Attack, uh, the submarine simulation series which I'm going to be playing, and have been playing for the last several weeks. Um, in this one, the mission is to take out several enemy patrol craft. Um, we've done this once before, but the scale's a little bit bigger. There's four of them in this mission, and um, they have a variety of speeds, ranges, and contact depths, so uh, not, I don't know what I'm talking about, not depths, but a variety of different speeds, ranges, and um, a couple, two different types of, uh, of vessels here. So the plot here is that these Iranian fast attack craft are once again attacking neutral merchant ships there, and um, our goal is to both plot the course and uh, position of our friendly merchants, as well as find the bad guys and destroy them. Now the bad guys are in the middle of an attack on some um, friendly merchant ships. There's really no way to stop that. There's simply not enough time. They already begin the mission in the midst of an attack. So, unfortunately these friendly vessels, which our secondary objective is to plot them, uh, will likely not last very long. Now this is one you see here, there's one drawback to playing on easier difficulty, and that's that your mission contacts get preloaded into the into the game here. So you can't delete trackers one through three. So you can only add in this case tracker four because um, I haven't picked up the fourth uh, enemy target, which means in a situation like this where I need to rapidly um, plot uh, merchant vessels, I'm not able to because I can only track one at a time, so as you can see there, there's a report of a contact breaking up already. Basically within the first minute, the enemy is starts destroying your, your friendly merchants and you really don't have much time and if you have the easy difficulty on you're simply not going to be able to tr get all of them in time or it's unlikely that you'll be able to get all of them in time because if you try and remove the actual primary objective from your tracking list it'll just re-add it again so here you see I'm deploying the TB23 toad array I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in this mission I'm going to talk about kind of the layer and then the toad sonar arrays at a very high level overview because I'll be honest, I am not a um, scientist, I'm not someone who's great at physics, so I will admit I don't know the ins and outs or the details of, uh, of how a layer works or how exactly how toad sonar works, but I will explain it to the best of my ability in kind of layman's terms here. As you see, I'm double checking some of those targets which I've plotted and um, need to destroy. Um, actually, I'm looking at this here real quick just for a moment. You can see the enemy ships really aren't much of a threat to me, um, unless I surface, that is. You know, they've got some larger caliber weapons, they've got surface-to-surface -surface missiles, but nothing that would really be able to attack me. I don't, I don't see any depth charges or anything like that. Um, so as far as that's concerned, uh, not really anything they can do to hurt me, which is kind of nice. It's also somewhat realistic, you know, most uh, Iranian patrol vessels likely wouldn't be able to do much against a modern submarine, and uh, kind of gives it a, a Tom Clancy-like feel. Uh, if you've read uh, Red Storm Rising or SSN, American submarines tend to just decimate uh, enemy submarines with really little to no, uh, no pushback, even against the Russians in Red Storm Rising. Uh, the American subfleet just decimates the Russians with very limited losses to their cells, which makes some sense because the American submarine force was so darn uh, quiet compared to the Russians, but it does seem a little bit far-fetched, you know, circumstances, there'd be, in, in a war like that, there'd be so many different unique scenarios that would come up that you would have to lose some submarines, if only from bad luck, uh, or maybe you were st you were under the layer and they were uh, coming in a, a, a well it's hard to explain but basically there's you know numerous situations that can give an advantage to a noisier submarine maybe they're above the layer and you're below it and you don't hear them or vice versa um, and then you know they switch depths and come in on your baffles which is behind your sub and you don't hear them and they get a track on you or something to that effect but anyway um, this is going to be the longest part of this scenario is me basically just trying to get good fire control um, fire control plots on these targets. My goal is to try and launch as quickly as possible to kind of have like a shock and awe type 
impact on the uh, enemy vessels. So I want to try and get good plots on all of them simultaneously, and then launch as quickly to simultaneously as I as I can. So for the next several minutes, I'm going to be kind of trying to plot these out. Like I said, the goal is to get this dotted line that's moving downward to be as straight as possible. That means your plot is as accurate as uh, as possible. And uh, for quick vessels, it can be kind of difficult. Um, but anyways, I was talking about the layer. I br you briefly saw something on the screen, and, and also, um, quickly, I do want to apologize if the image quality of this video isn't as good as some of the previous ones. I recorded in substandard HD. That's because this game doesn't play in HD. It's an older game. It was designed for DOS. There's uh, Most of these textures are hard-coded, so it's not like a lot of newer games where resolutions are variable. Um, but uh, that that isn't any different. But what was different is some of my exploit settings changed a bit, and I didn't realize it till I'd after you know already played the scenario and saved it uh, that it was recording in a lower definition. Now I'm going to upscale it to 720p, but um, it's you know obviously it's not it's not HD, and I, I'm worried that maybe because of the settings being a little bit lower, some of the text may be a bit hazy. At the same time, I didn't want to abandon the episode and, and miss a week of of the episode. Um, so anyway, uh, enough rambling there. But uh, as I was saying, um, you need to get these uh, these tracks straight down the middle. And I've mentioned it a few times already today here as I'm going to just kind of shift gears. Um, the topic for today's discussion is going to be what's called the thermocline layer, I believe. It's, it's called the layer in short, but it's essentially what it is, is the ocean is a, a very complex a very complex body, if you will, and it's not just water, obviously, that, that's in it. So what that what the thermocline layer is, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because if you read any Tom Clancy or really any other nautical writers, anything about submarines, you're going to hear a lot about it. And a lot of times it's one of those things that doesn't seem to be too clearly explained, although Clancy does a good job of explaining it in... Uh, in Red Storm Rising, I think he might have done a better job explaining it there than he did in SSN, but that's beside the point. Um, essentially, it's something that comes up a lot and is is one of the most important elements of submarine warfare, so I figured I would touch upon it. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure how much it came up during World War II. I'm not sure how much submariners and warships knew about the lair back in World War II. Um, in a lot of cases, the layer might have been deep enough that the submarines of the time might not have been able to get down deep enough, except maybe close into shore to get underneath the layer. But um, anyway, going back without, hopefully, without rambling too much, the thermocline layer is essentially a point in the water when the temperature of the water changes very, very rapidly in a very short period of time. So. An ocean is made up of many, many, many different things, many different chemicals, many different items. You have water, you've got salt, um, and it has almost like its own weather structure within the ocean. You know, the the makeup, the chemical makeup, the compounds, the um, a lot of the, the, the items in, in the ocean, the minerals, those different types of things that are in the water can be very different in different spots of the ocean. Um, obviously, you know, oceans are salt water, but there's a lot more to it. And like I said, I'm not a physicist, so I'm not going to go into, or, or a chemist, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But essentially, there are these different kind of weather patterns almost within the oceans. And I don't mean, you know, above water weather, I mean actual, the water itself is very different. And one of the things that occurs in the ocean is when you get to a certain depth, uh, there's something called the layer. And as I've already said, what that is, is that's a point in the water when the water temperature rapidly changes. So from the perhaps more warm water near the surface, then after a certain depth, it changes very quickly. Just very quickly. And for whatever reason, you know, it's not a gradual change, it's something that just happens. Almost within a matter of feet, the temperature can change quite a bit. Um, I don't know exactly how much, but it's it's a very big temperature uh, change relative. And what that does 
is it creates these two kind of weather patterns of a warmer water up near the surface and a cooler water a little bit further down. And that can change dramatically. If you're closer in shore, that might occur at a shallower depth. If you're further out to sea, it might occur at a, at a deeper depth. You know, a storm, weather conditions, a bad storm could potentially cause there not to be any layer or at least a very limited layer. You know, you might have to go extremely deep to see those differences if the water is really churning. Um, and by all means, if, if there's anyone who's listening to this video who knows more about this than I do, I'm clearly I'm trying to explain this in layman terms, please throw a comment in, explain it, post a video response, I'd be happy to link you for it. Um, just putting that out there. This is layman terms, what I understand about the layer. So, as I said, this is this variable point in the water where temperature changes and what that has an impact on in submarine warfare is this the point below where when you're below the layer when you're underneath that temperature change you're almost shielded from items above the layer um, so basically what that means is if a enemy surface vessel uh, is trying to listen for you this temperature change almost creates what's like a mirror where they don't hear you or they have a harder time hearing your vessel when you're below the layer. Now that can go both ways. If a submarine's below the layer, it may be able to hear surface vessels or submarines that are above that temperature difference, but it might not be able to get a good fix on where they are, what their range is, uh, what their bearings are. There's a lot of distortion that can occur. So while the layer may provide protection to a submarine from surface vessels to a certain degree, you know, it's not impossible to be heard below the layer, it's just much more difficult. While the layer may provide some uh, protection, it can also hamper fire control and other abilities like that. So what you often see submarines do is kind of playing with that, is, is jumping above the layer to get fire control, jumping below the layer to get safe from surface vessels that maybe are searching for them. Um, and this is, it's an incredibly amazing geographic or geological feature, I think, because if you actually think about it, you know, this is, doesn't just affect act, this doesn't just affect passive sonar. This can affect active sonar. You know, the stereotypical pings that ships give off can almost bounce off the layer in a way uh, where they, they're diminished or, or their, um, their sound is distorted so that the surface vessel, even if the ping gets to where the submarine is, the layer distorts the feedback so much that they're not able to tell the submarine is there. So what that does is that creates this whole new element to submarine warfare where you've got almost like a safe haven below a certain depth at, at certain times where sometimes it's there and in other weather conditions it might not be and it can change dramatically depending on the weather conditions or depending on the depth so you have submarines going above the layer and going below the layer and doing all these different things that um, just adds a whole new level of, of tactical elements to to submarine combat that you would never seem to think about and that you know a lot of people probably don't know about um, the other item that I wanted to touch upon in this video is uh, towed sonar arrays and kind of their their role and their impact on on using um, you know the layer to one's advantage so a towed sonar array is essentially a long wire if you will that's dragged behind a submarine um, and has a bunch of mini microphones on it essentially it's a mini it's a it's a giant super sensitive sonar in addition to the, the submarines already you know sonar built into it and it allows the submarine to dramatically enhance its ability to hear other vessels um, at longer ranges at slower speeds um, or just hear better basically in the water and there's several different types in fast attack in, in this game you actually get the TB16 sonar uh, towed array and the TB23 now both of those are real sonar arrays although according to the developer of the game um, most US submarines probably wouldn't have both sonar arrays fitted to them um, they're just the two most at the time the game was made they're the two most common I believe the US government is in the process of constructing what's called the TB29 which will be an even more sensitive towed sonar array uh, to fully replace the TB23 but essentially they're what they are is they're just long strands or long uh, sonar 
uh, pieces that get dragged behind a submarine and give you extra extra sensing abilities and that's another one of those things that plays a role in the layer because you know you can get a much more sensitive sonar picture with the sonar array but the layer can still play havoc on that and one thing that I thought was really interesting in recently reading Red Storm Rising is surface vessels also have these sonar arrays um, you know it's not just a locally placed sonar array this is a an enhancement or an additional uh, item that is added to to the uh, package if you will so some surface vessels have a tail as they're called which is a sonar array that gets dragged behind the surface vessel and for a surface vessel it's incredibly interesting because they actually have the ability to raise and lower that sonar array so you could put a towed sonar array below the layer for so a, a ship could theoretically sink that array below the layer depending on the depth obviously and get a very good picture of what was going on below the layer and giving just a much better picture of things to a surface vessel than would be possible otherwise so without these towed sonar arrays you know a submarine would have a huge advantage because it could duck above below the layer and it could um, just kind of play around with a surface vessel and kind of pick its spots but now a surface vessel which has a towed sonar array which it can drop below the water uh, below the layer now the surface vessel has a huge advantage because maybe the surface vessel is obviously the surface vessel would be above the layer the submarine might be below the layer it may not be able to hear the ship above it because the layer might distort the sounds instead the surface vessel drops its towed sonar below the layer and is able to hear the submarine and detect it and destroy it without them even being aware that they're there or without them being aware of the proximity to where they are and it's just it again it adds another one of those unique elements to uh, sonar sonar and submarine kind of cat and mouse games that would that would occur if there ever were a conflict between you know uh, major naval powers these days uh, there really hasn't been a big submarine conflict in years but still it's one of those interesting things it's one of the big things that made up the cold war and uh, by the way like I said on the screen here I'm just just trying to get some good fire control solutions for these targets here just trying to make it as accurate as possible it looks like I've got some pretty good ones here these lines are, are very straight it seems like there's a few potential inaccuracies as things just kind of slowly change over time maybe the vessels are changing course uh, maybe not not sure I've got one target that's way far out there 29 nautical miles about a three minute trip for a harpoon the other three targets are all really close under a one minute uh, harpoon shot so I'll fire the, the long range one first like I said I would like to be able to destroy them all more or less at the same time so we'll see how that plays out here as I as I start my attacks here but as I said, that just the layer and the towed sonar arrays just it, it adds an interesting element uh, to submarine warfare that didn't exist before. And uh, there's a couple of kind of interesting, really cool things about different types of sonars, different type of towed arrays. Um, the the sonars in the game, the TB16 and the TB23. If you play the game, you would think the 23 is better. Um, you would say, why would you ever use the TB-16? Because the TB-23 picks up way more stuff. You're going to pick up targets way easier with that TB-23 uh, towed sonar array, especially in the early scenarios where there's really no need to maneuver and things like that. You can just kind of, kind of play through it like I am here without doing much with maneuvering. And the TB-23 is just phenomenal. You know, it might take about two minutes to deploy, uh, because it's almost, a, I believe it's about a half a mile long, it's something like 2,600 feet or more, maybe it's yards, that would obviously be over a mile. But this is an incredibly long array of hydrophones that are just listening in on, you know, enemy, enemy contacts or potential enemy ships, and just incredibly sensitive. Um, and like I said, they've got even more sensitive ones now. But... It, it picks up targets just so much better than the TB-16 does. The TB-16 um, is only about, I think, I, I, I know the 23 is about half a mile. The 16, I believe, is only like 900 feet. It's much, much shorter. Um, and has, therefore, it has many fewer hydrophones on it, which makes it less sensitive. But um, the reason that... Uh, I bring that up is because there are two different types essentially. The, the 23 is a very long, very ultra sensitive towed sonar array. However, it has a weakness. After you get about about 
after you get above about 10 knots, uh, it doesn't hear anything. It gets washed out, as it's called, which essentially means that the flow of the water over the hydrophones is too great for it to be able to pick up other sounds. It just, it's not effective after that point. Um, the TB-16, however, because it's smaller and has fewer hydrophones, uh, can operate at, at much higher speeds than the, than the TB-23. Now, like I said, in this game, it doesn't make much of a difference in these early scenarios how quick you're moving. I tend to move it around 2 to 5 knots because uh, in the Persian Gulf we're operating at relatively shallow depths. Um, I don't really need to maneuver against anyone right now. I'm basically just a missile platform launching harpoon after harpoon against enemy targets here. And as you see, my first two harpoons have found their targets, so I, I must have had some good fire control solutions there as this harpoon crushes into my second target here. Um, but essentially, it's another one of those things that adds a little bit of elements of, of tactics and cat and mouse play to this game in particular. Like I said, the developers even admit it's unlikely a submarine would have both the 16 and the 23, but as you can see there, I've got the 23 deployed. Um, the 16 also deploys much quicker, so if you're in a bind and you need it out there now and every second could potentially cost you your life, use the TB-16. It gets out there way quicker. Um, I don't honestly know if a submarine can, can put the towed sonar array above and below the layer like a service vessel does. It might be difficult because there'd need to be some kind of essentially raising mechanism to put it up above the, the submarine and I think that might be more difficult uh, than, than a ship where it just needs to kind of weight it and drop it down. Don't quote me on that though. Um, but essentially just kind of these interesting little things where the TB-16, uh, while maybe not being as sensitive, has a lot of uses in that uh, it's, it's a more effective higher speed uh, unit while the um, TB-23 is something that will not uh, work at, at higher speeds. Um, so that's one of those kind of interesting things. At the very least, like I said, I'm not sure if a submarine has the capability of raising or lowering towed sonar like a surface vessel would but um, and, and I, I don't know if surface vessels do in this game either I just know that in real life they can um, but whether like I said whether they can in real life or not the submarine vessels cannot alter the, the depth of the towed sonar array uh, in the game and I haven't noticed you know if you're kind of close to the layer if a if the array can be below you and drop down below the layer, there's really no option to control how the, the sonar works in this game other than just deploying it and choosing which one you want to use. But uh, that choice of being able to use the, the um, 16 or the 23, at least in-game, is a nice in-game option where it gives you um, more of a tactical decision to make and more of a, not really strategic, but more of a tactical decision to make with how you're going to play the game. Um, so that's kind of an interesting little thing. Like I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, I might talk more about in depth about it uh, later in the series once I research it a bit more. I just thought that would be something kind of interesting to talk about in this in this series because they they do play a big role in how you play the game. Um, you know, uh, I'll be honest, your internal sonar is nowhere near as sensitive as these towed arrays. So if you just try and rely on your internal sonar, it might work okay for some of the scenarios, but Not most of them. Um, you know, the vast majority are not going to work well. And uh, you see there, I hit my first two targets. My third missile actually hit uh, one of my one of my other targets, so I've gotten three hits out of four shots. Not bad. I just fired off another harpoon and did uh, something. Like I said, I'm shifting gears kind of back to the game discussion and did something rather foolish. I didn't update the track, so while I was updating the track and the passive sonar it was not actively being pushed to my missile so my missile still fired uh, with the previous fire control solution which obviously the what the missile on that uh, target that I'm shooting at again missed uh, we're talking about the um, Sierra 10 target there um, so that one will almost certainly miss that means I basically ensured that I have two misses here at a minimum now I can use seven harpoons which is about half of my total loadout of of harpoon missiles here to destroy the enemy targets and I'm just making sure my fire control solution is really good on this one before I go ahead and launch and, and obviously update um, the the track here 
So going ahead and fire both of these harpoons out and hopefully I've got both of these targets taken care of uh, very shortly here within about two minutes. So um, I'm going to assume I'm going to hit these targets. Uh, if not, I'll re-record the audio. But this video is coming up to a little bit of a conclusion here. Like I said, if the quality of the video wasn't as good in this video, I do apologize. Um, as I said, it was definitely kind of a little bit of a mix up in the recording here for the video but I didn't want to just scrap the episode altogether and I had already saved the mission and I didn't want to skip one and jump ahead to five because the the fifth mission does have some new elements to it uh, which I wanted to discuss I believe it's the one that introduces some submarine warfare in it or at least tracking enemy submarines and that would definitely uh, that'll pose a, an interesting and a new discussion that uh, is worthy uh, covering um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in the next episode. Now you see this cruise missile coming in, and it's about to hit the PT boat, which is actually the command ship of the other four. So there was a, a four-ship flotilla of um, fast attack craft, which we were attacking here. We just got the headquarters ship with the second harpoon. We uh, had wounded it previously with a previous harpoon, and we just finished it off. So that's going to be three targets destroyed here with the use of five harpoons. Uh, only one miss so far, although that second uh, miss is, is out there right now. I'm almost certain it's going to miss. Um, anyway, this is definitely one of the longer videos in the series. I hope my explanation of the thermocline layer kind of makes sense and kind of how toad sonar arrays can be used. Um, and, and like I said, that much more uh, interesting tactical element that gets added to the game by it being included because... Uh, you know, I'm sure all the other major subsims around include it. I honestly would be curious to see if Fast Attack includes it. There's no way for it to really tell you whether it's included, and submarines at the time didn't have the ability to detect the layer. That's one of those uh, one of those things about more modern submarines is they've actually got very sophisticated sensors in them that allow them to detect water temperature and see where the layer is and use it to their advantage. Uh, that wasn't something that was really able to be done by subs until really, I think, about the 60s. Um, but uh, World War II subs didn't have the capability. Still, it would have definitely been something that had some kind of impact on their operations. Now, out in the Atlantic where it's very deep, the layer might not be till three, 400 feet. That starts getting closer toward crush depth or, you know, a depth that a lot of those subs might not want to go. But... Um, you know, you can imagine during World War II if a sub was able to duck beneath a layer with uh, sensors being far less sensitive, um, it could have been a, a very effective way for those types of submarines to, to hide and continue to operate and survive from either the Japanese anti-submarine warfare units or German anti-warfare or anti-submarine warfare units, uh, depending on your, uh, your, you know, theater. But anyway, uh, I could just start rambling. Um, which I may already be a danger of doing, but I could just start rambling. I, I'm not going to do that. Um, so basically, I, you saw there I hit that uh, that last submarine or that last uh, patrol craft for a successful mission here. I've destroyed all four enemy targets that were required of me. I've also uh, plotted one of the three merchant ships before they got sunk. Uh, so my secondary mission was somewhat partially uh, uh, accomplished. Um, we're past the halfway point in the campaign for the Persian Gulf. So far, we've only been killing Iranian soldiers. Well, I believe that changes to Iraqi shortly. Uh, we're still in command of the uh, USS Pittsburgh here, uh, a vertical launch uh, submarine. And uh, I've got a lot of interesting things worth talking about. Like I said, I believe the next, next uh, video starts discussing submarine warfare. But uh, I don't want to get into that now here. It's kind of weird situation here where it seems like the contact's going in and out of uh, contact. That's a little bit weird. But um, there you go. Getting, uh, getting a contact breaking up. So there we go. We've uh, accomplished our mission successfully. And um, after a little bit of a, a lengthy video here, that's going to more or less wrap us up here at about 30 minutes. So uh, shouldn't have to f ramble or fill you in anymore. We should be kind of good to go from here. I do want to thank you for watching. Like I said, this is probably the most, you know, most 
commitment I've shown over a long period of time. I've had series with more videos, but over a long period of time and a regular release schedule, probably the most consistent I've shown. So if you do like this, definitely would appreciate a like uh, and a comment. Uh, I've been getting a lot of good comments on some of these videos and others, and uh, I really do appreciate it. It means a lot that you, you guys stick around and, and apparently enjoy some of these videos that I'm doing. So um, until next time, uh, until next week, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching and uh, signing out.